I had slides saying that last year, actually also, or the year before. Friends of my friends are my friends. Uh, so the way I get to know uh, Marcel was last year, uh, actually two years ago in 2014, John Fox was giving a talk on the second day. And during the first day, uh, Marcel decided to join us all the way from Berlin, I think. Crazy move. Because he wanted to see uh, the talk from, uh, from his friends, from John Fox, uh, uh, which we send our, all our love to San Francisco. Uh, I saw John two weeks ago uh, at Dub Dub. Um, I don't recall if you actually you you actually worked with the Next technologies. You didn't work at Next, but you worked with the Next technology, which which makes you already a very old school guy. And then, did you work at Apple? You never really worked at Apple. You worked at Apple. I was sure about that. And now you are basically working at Microsoft soon. Um, so I found it's it's an interesting uh, uh, history, anyways. Um, and um, yeah. The, Working at Microsoft, for those who don't know, because uh, uh, Marcel works at uh, uh, Six Wonder Kinder, and they have been bought by Microsoft. Um, and so, yeah, I'm very happy that he's here with us today. And uh, yeah, let's give him a round of applause. OK, um, you already stole my intro slide, um, <laughs> but that's OK. Uh, Again, um, just as uh, uh, he said, um, I used to work at, um, at the BBC, at Apple, at a company called Livescribe that makes little pens. And um, yeah, the company I currently work for is ex Windows, and it just just been bought by Microsoft. So I have switched to the dark side. Um, but what I'm talking about today is software architecture. And that's fortunately um, independent. So um, why? why why software architecture? Why do I care? Well, first, of course, you don't really have a choice, right? I mean, if you have a piece of software and it's more than one line of code, it has an architecture. Um, usually, um, that um, architecture is the big ball of mud, um, first coined by Brian Foote in 97. And about, I think, 80% of software probably has this architecture. Who here has built a big ball of mud? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Yeah, we're all in, to, in this together. Um, and, and of course, the big ball of mud has some, some issues. And, and just like my colleague, Mr. Wrench, um, I'm going to go to civil engineering, although a little older. Um, this, is, this is sort of, actually, this is slightly better than the big ball of mud, because there's actually structure and organization here, right? We just pile the rocks on top of each other. The pyramid's about 160 meters high. And um, the material used was 7.5 million tons of these rocks that we piled on top, top of each other. Now, with software, we don't, fortunately, it doesn't weigh anything because otherwise we wouldn't be able to lug our laptops. Um, we can do better, right? Um, my favorite church right here in Cologne, the Cologne Cathedral, um, is slightly higher, a lot more enclosed space, a lot better windows, right? And it was built with 160,000 tons of material. That's a lot less. Um, and they didn't have better building materials. They were still just piling you know, the rocks on, on top of each other. But what, what, what was the difference? Well, they discovered the arch, right? a better way of arranging that pile of rubble. And that makes all the difference, right? knowing how to arrange the stones. And Coming back to software, um, let's, let's have this, this, this question of what does it take to build personal computing, right? It was first built in the 70s at uh, Xerox PARC. Uh, the machine you see on the left, that's, a, that's an Alto. And what did they have? They had a monochrome GUI, pretty much you know, overlapping windows, what we have, some um, <laughs> proportional fonts. Um, they had networking. Ethernet right, was also invented there. They had word processing. The pre uh, precursor to Microsoft Word was inv invented there. The whole thing, according to Alan Kay, was about 10,000 lines of code. A little later, we have Microsoft Windows, right? Has a color GUI. That's nicer. Full internet. That's a little bit more networking, although, you know, email, a little bit browsing. OK, we got the, the World Wide Web. It has word processing, so, you know, now you don't have the precursor to Word. You have Word or Pages. And Windows with Office, that's 100 million lines of code. So a factor 10,000. And Alan Kay, a couple of years ago, he um, 
did a research project um, at Viewpoints Research Institute, and they built a system called Frank because they thought we can do better. We can really do a lot better. And of course, it's all prototypes, but it's, it's working personal computing with the color GUI, with internet, with word processing, in, a, in less than 100,000 lines of code. So that's a factor of a, th of a thousand still, with sort of the same features. Now, of course, not nearly as polished, not all the features, but I don't think the difference is a factor of a thousand in terms of, you know, how good is it? And they say the difference is architecture. I didn't check the code, but they say so. Um, if that's not motivation enough, um, there was in 1986, there was a famous Bentley, uh, Bentley's challenge. Uh, write a program to count words, right? Give me the 10 or n most frequent words. And Don Knuth, no slouch, he, you know, the, the Obi-Wan of computer science, he came back after a while and he had, you know, 12 pages of beautiful, I only showed six here because it was too, too many pages, of beautiful Pascal in his um, web, uh, the literate programming style. And then Doug McElroy, who invented Unix pipes, came back with six lines of code, which actually have the advantage that most of the parts are reusable, right? Now, you might say that's not a fair comparison because, it's, you know, one is a lot faster, and, but that's actually kind, kind of the point, right? Because, I don't know about you, I don't get paid for being fair. I get paid for writing software. And if I get, you know, six lines worth of, versus 12 pages, yeah, that, that, that makes a difference, right? <laughs> um, so I, I hope I've motivated you a little bit. And, and of course, the difference here is that, you know, this is pipe and filter architecture, the, 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 the pipe, and the other one was essentially procedural. So, so I hope I've motivated you just slightly. And so here's what the rest of the talk is going to be. So I will have to talk a little bit about theory. Um, components, connectors, configurations, that's sort of what you have in software architecture. Um, and then I'm going to bring it back to Coco um, with some of the architectural elements that are in Coco that we all kind of are familiar with, but we may have not thought about them as architectural elements. And I think that these are the things that actually make Coco as cool as it is. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about a little bit about the special architectural issues that we have in, in, in UI software, because there are some, and some potential linguistic support that might help with that. And I'm gonna close with a bit of an example although there's gonna be some more examples in between. So, the theory. What's, what's software architecture? Essentially, it's you know, the, the overall structure of your software. You have parts, and they're connected in some way, shape, or form. And the parts we call components, procedures, programs, servers, variables, things like that. Classes, objects, obviously. And the connectors, that's the, the things that, that tell us how, the, how they communicate, right? For example, the pipes, procedure calls, message sends, remote procedure calls, things like that. Um, and of course, most of the programming languages talk mostly about the components, right? We, we add procedures, we add methods, but they don't really, we don't, we don't really add new ways of interacting usually, not directly. And so the connectors, they're, they've been a bit neglected, but I think they're actually the most important part of this. So if we, we, we can get something more going with the connectors, um, that may be a, a useful thing. And of course, once you put the components and connectors together, um, you get configurations, um, also known as systems, programs, and of course, it's recursive, so those can be components again, or even connectors. And then you have styles, which are sort of like the classes um, of, of software architecture. Essentially, they're types of, of systems, right? So for example, there's the um, uh, pipe and filter style is obviously you have pipes and you have filters, and that's a specific style. So just to very briefly put that in, in, uh, in put, put some detail on that, again, you have the components. Um, they're, the they're where the co computation happens. That's where storage happens. And components, we, we um, call the, the pieces that connect uh, components to, 
two connectors ports for whatever reason. And then we have the connectors, and they actually look very similar. Um, again, they, they mediate interaction, and they have roles. And you, put, you, you, you connect the uh, ports to roles, and then you have a configuration, which then looks something like this. And that's a lot. Uh, for them, this would probably be a, a, a small pipe and filter system. For example, ls pipe word count, right? And that's a lot of uh, pieces. And so let's, you know, let's go, go back and just uh, boxes and arrows, boxes and arrows. <laughs> Um, and uh, the architectural community, they, they've, they've also had some, some initial language support for, for, for describing systems, architectural description languages, and the system then in, in such a language, this one's called ACME, um, would look uh, like this. You say there's a system, and we have a component, uh, LS, that has a port standard in, standard out, and another one, word count, again, standard in, standard out, and we have a connector, it's called a pipe, and it has a source and a sink, and then we put them together, and whoop-de-doo, we have a system. Of course, this all is a little simpler when you put it in a Unix shell, we just say ls pipe word count, which is one of the reasons architectural description languages haven't caught on. Um, and of course, the, 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 the counterpoint to that is that, for example, the Unix shell is an architectural description language of specific architectures, pipe and filter architectures. Uh, sort of a very brief over overview of um, some connectors and styles. Um, there's huge catalogs of these, well, huge, several pages of, of, of different variations. We're not going to go into those. What we have here, sort of, some of the basic ones are sort of call and return, right? That's the one, that's sort of our bread and butter one, right? We call a, me we call a procedure, we send a message, call and return, so return something or call a function. Um, data flow, we just talked about it, pipes and filters, the sort of the reactive stuff we've, we've been hearing about, that's a data flow. Constraints, um, there are specific types of constra constraints that are also data flow. Impl implicit invocation, um, sort of, um, that's, uh, and it's notification center, right? We don't really specify where it goes, we just kind of broadcast it and somebody signs up for it and that's why the uh, invocation is implicit, right? Messaging, obviously, um, I, I pulled that out as a special case. It's really a, a variant of call and return, but you can have, for example, asynchronous messaging. You can have messaging across um, procedure binaries. It's a very flexible type of connector. And um, REST, minor, minor, very minor little architectural style that gave us the World Wide Web, right? Um, and it's one of those that Nobody really designed it that way, and the people that designed systems like that came up with something different, and then they discovered, actually, it works really well if you do it this way. Um, here's a little graphical representation of connectors. Um, they come sort of in a hierarchy, I personally believe. <laughs> and so, for, so you have sort of the basic, you know, very abstract, you have a connector, um, and then on the left, you see some data flow connectors, and uh, in the middle, for sort of the access storage connectors, um, for example, various different types of variables, databases, um, HTTP servers, communicating over REST, and then uh, sort of more on the right, you have sort of the variants of messaging, asynchronous messaging, blah, blah, blah. And very up, off, off to the right, I have um, what I call an adapter which adapts between different architectural styles, and we're going to talk about that a little later. Um, what's interesting is that different programming languages are really sort of a set of these uh, connectors, right? For example, if you have a Unix um, shell, um, we have pipes, right? We have um, assignment when you, when you actually do variables there. You have the environment variables. You have files, right? Um, and, and so programming languages are largely defined by really what, what, what they do in here, right? And, and different programming languages do d different parts, right? This is Smalltalk or Objective-C, the, the objective part, right? We, have we still have assignment. We don't have pipes anymore. We have global variables. We have, now we have instance variables, which we didn't have before. And we have Smalltalk messages or Objective-C messages. And, of course, messaging, again, is, is one of those 
one of really a very fundamental style. And um, actually, Alan Kay once said that, that he was sorry he term, termed the coin, uh, uh, coined the term object orientation, because he says uh, that was actually focusing on the wrong thing. Uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's really about the messaging. It's about the stuff that goes in between the connectors. Right? And again, if, if, if you do different types of messaging, so if you have synchronous messaging, you have small talk, right? Or Objective-C or Swift. If you have asynchronous messaging as your default, you have Erlang. Um, you can have local or remote messaging, right? If you have local messaging, um, you know, that's a typical programming language. If you have remote messaging, that's your typical system integration tool. Message buses, for example, have that. Um, you can have call-based, right? Again, Objective C, uh, uh, small talk, or you can have reified messages, right? For example, the BO, B operating system had reified messaging. It had objects that you sent across as messages. And of course, you can have early and late bound. Quick thing about adapters. Um, you're all really actually quite familiar with them. For example, standard, the standard I.O. library is an adapter, right? It adapts the call and return style that you use in your C program to the pipe and filter style that you use in shell. Right? And this is what a program uh, looks like in that style. Right? It's adapting the, the uppercase, which is a, well, it's a macro, but let's call it a function, uh, the two upper func uh, function, and it adapts it into a filter that can be used in the pipe and filter style in shell. Objective-C is an adapter, right? Inside the objects, essentially, you use C, procedural, and you use uh, messaging on the outside for the components to interact, for the objects to interact. And, of course, there's in, in Coco, there's lots of specific adapters, which I'm going to talk about later. Quick example about adapting different um, um, styles. Let's say... The, the humble description method, right? And you use it, and you have a, a, a nested, nested arrays, right? Um, so you have like a thousand arrays, and, and each one is just nested in, 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 in the previous level. And you would say, and, and, and it, you return the description, right? That's call and return. Um, and when I do this, there's a bit of a problem, right? Quadratic time and space, right? And the, the, the bottom, let's see, can, I, can you see this? Oh, yeah, I think this is big enough. Um, the actual final description, that, that, that's the bottom line, right? And the temporary space is the green line. And even with like 50, 50 nested areas, I'm already at about like 750K. And you can crash your machine like with 1,000. I think 1,000 is, is enough to crash. Probably, uh, certainly the program, and you can, might, might, might not even get your, your machine to kernel panic because it's running out of swap. And this is very, I mean, the, the code isn't really, that, 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 that shouldn't really be a problem, right? I mean, why is this a problem? And I would say the problem is call and return architectural style. And let's look at the uh, sample implementation of the description method, right? So. Nothing really unusual. You get a, I mean, you, we've all written this a thousand times, right? Description, right? Get a mutable string, append the, the, the class name and the pointer, and then do the contents, right? In this, this, this case, the content, well, is the descriptions of the subsidiary objects, right? And that's the problem, right? Because each time, because it's a call and return style, I have to get a fully formed result and insert it into the new result. <coughs> and if I have a call stack of these, it's n width, right, and m deep, and in this case, n is equals to m, and therefore n squared. Oops. And actually, I can actually, uh, with just two arrays that point to each other, of course, you can call, cause an infinite stack recursion, it just crashes. So wh what can we do? Well. The, one of the neat things about um, pipe and filter style is that you don't return the result. You pass it forward to your next pipe, right? So let's, let's do that instead. So no return value, void, right? And we just use printf from the standard I.O. library that we just saw. 
And this time, instead of the, the recursive part, instead of um, doing a return, it just passes, it essentially passes the baton to the sub, sub array and it just writes to the result and, it, and it's completely linear. Right? It's no problem whatsoever. But, of course, there's other issues, right? This is going to standard out. Now, what if I don't want to go to standard out? Oh, well, I can potentially pass in the file descriptor. Um, then I can at least tell it, you know, I want to go to standard error or some file or something. But what if I want to have um, the thing in memory? Well, then it gets tricky, right? Because we don't have memory streams. There was an AT&T library, I think, as a replacement that had memory streams, but we don't have them, right? So what, 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 what do I do? I P open the thing or something. Write to a temporary file, map it back in. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's disgusting. And that's architectural, ar architectural mismatch. Um, essentially, the functionality is now great, right? But the packaging just doesn't work for me. And in the other case, the packaging was great, but the functionality just wasn't really that great. And it's all because of architecture. And this is a seminal paper, 1995. Architectural mismatch, why reuse is so hard. And one of the problems is packaging mismatch, which is what we have here. Um, another is, um, and core data and EOF are my favorites in that, that you, know, you require subclassing. Well, that's great if you have one, right? But if you have two, uh, <laughs> oops. Right? And we don't have multiple inheritance, and even if we did, we probably wouldn't want to use it. Um, typical framework problem is, is the threat of control, right? A framework usually demands that it run the thread of control and it calls you. Well, what if you have two frameworks that are like that? Well, you're not gonna be able to reuse them. <coughs> and of course, dependencies, right? You know, you want this little thing and it pulls in. I mean, if you've ever used Python or Ruby or something and you, have, you think there's, there's this tiny little program, or Scala, I think, does that too, and you say, okay, run the dependencies and you, know, you come back an hour later and it's still going. And of course, this was 1995, and of course, we're you know we're we're, we're software, and you know we we really solve our problems. And in 2009, well, architectural mismatch, why you reuse is still so hard. Um, nothing really changed. So, coming back to our example, what can we do? Well, objects, right? Objects are cool. Um, so we replace the, the the file descriptor with a with um, an MPW stream. That's, that's a um, set of classes I wrote, and we send messages, but same principle. And we just uh, replace the printf with um, a message called printf, and instead of uh, 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 doing the, um, here in the, uh, in the for loop, instead of the, um, Instead of calling the, the, uh, the uh, returning description, we actually write that object to the stream. The stream does a double dispatch back to us, and everything is happy. And we can refactor a little, right? So very, very quickly, um, a, lot of t a lot of streams are probably going to have this type of uh, action where you just write the entire array out. So let's just you know, replace that with the right array contents. Um, also, that object header is always the same, so let's put that there. And um, now that we have blocks, we can wrap the whole thing, and wow, this looks a lot nicer. Right? And I've actually um, made describing easier. And of course, now that these are objects, I can also go back and simply write a small cover method that actually I could add to NS object um, that says, well, if you want the description as a string, well, get me one of those stream, uh, uh, description streams that puts its results into a string, uh, write myself to that, and then return that string. whoop de doo And we have now successfully adapted these different styles, stayed within the language, and reaped all the benefits. Right? We, it's, it's no longer quadratic. Um, uh, but it's also easily accessible. So, quick um, summary of that. 
And you can also, of course, since you have an object that's persistent, you can keep some state in that object. For, sorry, for example, if you have a recursive structure, you can make sure that um, you, uh, you, don't, you don't do an infinite recursion. Code is on, on GitHub. It's part of MPLE Foundation. I should probably extract it out. So that was sort of an example of what happens with architectural mismatch, what we can do about it. But of course, we're not done. Architectural mismatch is a lot worse for GUI programs. And there was a, an amazing paper. Sadly, it's behind a paywall um, on Springerlink by a guy called, uh, I think, Steve, Stéphane Chaty or something. I, it's French. I, can't, I don't know how to uh, pronounce it. And a somewhat uh, tongue-in-cheek titled Programs Equals Data Plus Algorithms Plus Architecture. And his argument was really that the, the principal problem, and, and, and I think we have this day to day, right? We notice that something is wrong. And I, I, for me, it was, this was an eye opener. And the, 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 he says the principal problem is that the architecture of GUI programs simply does not match the architecture that is supported by the languages we use to program them, right? It's completely different. One is sort of algorithmic, and our GUI programs just aren't algorithmic. We connect stuff. Right? And Coco does a lot to help this. And it's one of the cool things about the way Objective-C worked, because it's so flexible. It allowed to build these adapters, because it itself is an adapter. Right? And let's talk a little bit about some of those adapters. For example, the NSRun loop. Right? It, what, what, what does NSRun loop do? It adapts events that, you know, for example, in, in Windows or in classic Mac OS, you had to pull these events and, and call subroutines. And it just says, well, actually, we can turn those into messages. And just, you know, and, and, and messages, since messages are kind of our lingua franca in, 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 this, in this world, um, we're done, right? We, we now have this in, the, in, in our normal language. And of course, for me, the really cool part, I'm still blown away by target action, right? Target action means you, you add a message to a button, right? And that means I can, with a click, send a message to an object that's inside the program. Wow, I still think that's amazing. So the user becomes, becomes a message sender in the program. I still think that's amazing. Again, I talked about notifications. They're implicit notification. They're not quite as nicely integrated. It's sort of more manual. We have bindings. Um, never really worked well. I think we can talk a little bit about why, but that's data flow, right? That's sort of the data flow constraints, just two-way. Um, when we have something like perform selector on thread or perform selector on main thread or with delay, that's kind of like actors, right? These are asynchronous messages. And of course, nibs and storyboards are configurations, right? We have objects, we configure them, and we connect them. And of course, that means interface builder is actually an architectural des description language although a visual one. And of course, um, having connectors makes, sort of makes this even possible, right? Because um, there were many other interface builders sort of created around the same time. They all failed. And the reason I think they failed is because they didn't use connectors. Right? They used code generation. So you attached code to your button, which is awful, right? In Interface Builder, you don't do that. You just make a connection. That's because you have connectors. Um, but on the other hand, having a graphic edit, I mean, it's kind of cool having it be graphical, but it's also limiting. Right? We all know this. Right? We can't abstract properly. Um, we, we've got, it's gotten a little bit better than, uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, um, source control, because I mean, now that I think they sort them, so the diffs aren't completely useless, but you can't read them anyway. Um, and a nice alternative would probably be have that code, well, or, or rather, an alternative that, that, that people do use is to just use code, but then we lose the ADL, you know, the, the architectural description language abstractions that we have in Interface Builder. So we're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. We can use Interface Builder, and then we have these nice architectural abstractions, or we just code everything up, but then it's procedural code. And I think what would be better would be if we actually had linguistic support for architecture. Hmm, linguistic support, language. Ah, we just had a new language, right, from Apple. Right? 
But, of course, it doesn't solve this particular problem. Um, because, essentially, my personal uh, opinion is Chris Latner is a compiler guy, so he solves his problems. And they're algorithmic, mostly. And most of the Swift improvements are for algorithmic code, but in UI code, we have virtually no algorithms that we do. In Wonderlist 3, I think I implemented one algorithm, maybe two. Everything else was connecting stuff. And of course, Swift even goes back, right? It restricts the dynamic features. We have an object to see. So we don't have that fudge space anymore that we can actually make these adapters. We can't do it. As far as I know, we still, is it now possible to implement core data in Swift? It is? Yeah, last, last I checked it wasn't, but I mean, this may change, but it's, we're, I don't think, for, for, for architectural abstractions, I don't think we're moving in the right direction. Um, and of course, if that paper is correct, and I think it is, it's the archi architectural abstractions, or lack thereof, and lack of user extensible architectural abstractions that's killing us. So, what could uh, linguistic support look like? This is something I've been looking at since, well, I don't know, 2000, early 2000s. Um, I've uh, I published it recently, Objective Smalltalk. This is experimental. It's trying to be a architectural description language, although not description, it's, trying to, it's not just trying to describe, but to actually allow you to, to build architectures. And bring that flexibility that we have with messaging to the other connector types, right? We saw that, that messaging was sort of one connector type, and it's great that, that that's really flexible, but the other ones aren't, right? So, and so we, we have data support, we do have support for messaging, we have support for data flow a little bit, um, for data access, that's, that's much more flexible, called polymorphic identifiers, there was a paper, and we can implement things like data flow constraints. I'm not gonna talk about the tooling. So for example, what, what would data flow look like, right? So we have here a pipeline, a typical fetch, you know, fetch something from the web pipeline. So we fetch the URL, the arguments to that is the URL we, we're supposed to, the, the base URL we're supposed to fetch, and, and, and the, um, we, we give, into that pipeline, once we've built it, we, we put a relative URL in, and then it just goes through, right? We fetch, the, we, fetch we convert the JSON, usually to, to a dictionary, we extract something, we convert it to an object, and since that all runs on a background thread, we go, that, go to a main thread, and then we run some other code, some code with the result, right? And certainly in Wonderlist, we, we, we don't do it that way, we, use the call, we have callback hell, we hate it, you know, we have, I don't know, blocks at our pages, and it's not fun. Um, in Objective Smalltalk, uh, you just essentially write the pipe. That's the code, the actual code. I've, it's, I think I have that on GitHub somewhere. Um, so you, I probably don't need to explain it. It's really the same stuff that, I, that was in the diagram. One interesting thing about uh, using data flow like that is that error handling becomes a lot easier. Um, because if there's an error, you just don't send a result to the next guy, right? Um, with a call and return style, you have to return something, right? Um, and so either you return, you have to have some kind of mechanism of signaling that what you return is an error, and then, for example, I mean, in, in previous, last year, uh, the, the, uh, Apple told us, well, we should, you know, use the, what are they called, maybes or something, um, or you just interrupt the control flow with an exception, right? This is sort of the b basic ideas. And with data flow, you just, don't, you just don't call the next guy, right? And you do signal the error, but they kind of can all go together and signal the error. Also, uh, I was kind of surprised that, that jumping between threads also is completely trivial because your, your abstraction is not thread-based. Um, it took me a while to understand why that was so simple because we had a really hard time with all the blocks and you know running that block on that queue and that one on the other. Um, with uh, w when your main abstraction isn't the control flow anymore, the thread doesn't matter that much anymore. 
Second example, um, this, is, this I lifted from the Reactive Cocoa guys. It's a login button that's, that becomes enabled when the password field and the repeat password field match, right? Of course, in real life you would have more, but that's kind of, and, and, and what we have here is an Objective-C version of the do it once, right? This is what you would execute. The login button enabled, well, that's if the, the result of, of these equals. And so uh, trivially translating that to objective small talk, um, we lose the square brackets. Um, we use the colon equals for assignment. That's just the small talk tradition. That frees up the equals, so we don't use, have to use is equal anymore. And we use slashes because we use um, polymorphic identifiers, which are URIs, so we use slashes for separators. And let's lose the objective C. And so what, so this is the ones, right? And, and, but in an architectural language, we, we interpret the assignment a little differently. It's really a data flow connector, right? It says, connect the left-hand side to the right-hand side. And then immediately after you've done it once, dismantle the connection. And semantically, what would we need to keep this going? Well, we just have to not dismantle the connection, right? And so that's the change syntactically. And I don't know if you, if you saw it or if you missed it, that's the change. This now um, says, I'm not lo no longer doing an assignment, I'm doing actually a data flow connection here. And that means whenever the password field or the repeat field changes, this will be re-evaluated. Re and this is also real code. Um, that's the uh, reactive Cocoa equivalent. I had to make the font a little smaller. Now, of course, they're um, disadvantaged because they're, they, they had to do this in Objective-C. <coughs> but I think another reason this is so much more complicated with, you know, reduces and combine latest is that is, is actually also an architectural problem is that they're, they're layering several different architectural styles on top of each other, right? So basically what you want to do is you want to have a data flow constraint, which they then build on top of data flow streams, which they build on top of um, functional uh, abstractions on top of an object-oriented language. That's a lot of architect architectural mismatch you have right there. And it kind of goes away if you actually look at the architecture. In this example, I used polymorphic identifiers. Um, again, I, I also already mentioned this. These are, these are full URIs um, used as programming language identifiers. So, for example, HTML, you know, HTML is equal to HTTPAmazon.com. That's an actual uh, uh, syntactically valid piece of a program. The same for writing a file. If I want to store uh, into you know, the temp file that's named in a, the name is in a local variable called name. Um, and I want to put hello world in there. I just, I just use an assignment statement with some polymorphic identifiers on the side. Um, again, it, it uh, unifies these, um, uh, the composite references, right? So I can say text field int value, not that different. Um, but I, I can uh, use custom schemes. So for example, uh, defaults colon is means this is a, an identifier referencing the defaults database. Right? Why should that be completely different from other variables? It's just a variable with a name. Right? And um, we can have references um, by just saying ref colon. And that's now a reference to that text field's int value, which we use uh, KVC usually for that sort of stuff and strings. And we can do this without strings. So a more, more a slightly bigger example the classic temperature converter. So this is the model, right? Very simple. Celsius should always be equal to Fahrenheit times blah, blah, blah. And Fahrenheit should always be equal to Celsius that times that. Um, I'm using the delta blue uh, constraint solver underneath. So it, it is able to handle the fact that these are cycl cyclical, right? They reference each other. That's OK. And that's my model, right? Done, right? And now I want to hook that up to the UI. Well. I have a text field, and I want to have that, the int value, um, constrained to 
whatever is in my Celsius. And that slightly different uh, uh, connector, that just means it's bidirectional, right? Uh, which we can do because uh, with the, um, the other one, nice, it would have been nicer if the other one was also bidirectional, but uh, that would mean being capable of in inverting the formula, which is theoretically possible, but let's not do that. So that's my, that, that was my model, that, that's my UI, and that's add some persistence, right? And I say, well, I want to initialize the Celsius local variables from the defaults database once. You can notice that this is a colon equals. And then I want to always keep the, the, what's in the persistence in sync with what I've calculated. And that's a complete application. Model, view, persistence. Actual code. Not kidding. Um, let's see. Oh, and, and, and you will notice that this is also very similar to sort of the hexagonal architecture kind of thing, right? Where um, we keep the model um, separate and we make all the uh, outside parts as simple as possible, especially the connections to the outside part. So simple that there isn't really a question of whether the Celsius uh, text field has the right value. We don't. I mean, yeah, that's pretty obvious that it does, unless, you know, th that connector doesn't work. And, of course, that's sort of a general uh, uh, architectural overview, right? And if, if, if I look at Wunderlist or many other applications, well, what are they, right? They, you, you have your model, and there's some, maybe some invariance in there. But then the UI is just this, you know, essentially should be the same as whatever is in your memory model. So that's the connector. Um, the memory model, well, on startup, we want to get that from the persistence. And then after, after that, we want to keep it in sync. And then, of course, we want to sync with our uh, web backend. Now, of course, uh, these cannot be the same primitive connectors that we used before. Uh, so I can't actually write this code right now. But um, in terms of architecture, that's the architecture of my software, the top-level architecture. And of course, um, it would be really nice if I could then go and say, well, I can write a custom connector that is specific to my application. And then this would be actual the top level code of my program. And if I, you know, if I w w want to ask people, well, well, it's the architecture of program, well, that's it's right there. And it's correct. Um, well, but while I can't actually use this yet, I can use some of the insights, right? And that's sort of um, what thinking about architecture, I mean, on the one hand, of course, you want to get there that we can do this sort of thing. On the one hand, we have real world problems today. And so let's, you know, look at Wunderlist. Um, there's some of, some of the things we did that are sort of architectural based. We use real MVC, not sort of fake Apple MVC. Um, we use uh, hexagonal architecture as much as we can, not as much as I would like. Hexagonal architecture of ports and adapters, also, I think, clean. I think Bob Martin called it clean. Again, that's the sort of the concept uh, that you keep all the interesting, all the testable stuff in your model, talking only to other objects. You keep all the, all the peripheral stuff, um, persistence, UI, whatever, what have you, um, back end, you keep that on the outside. And you make these ports that just, and why? Why, why would they say ports? Hmm because it's, an, of course, because it's an architectural concept, um, as simple as possible, so uh, you are very confident that that works, that there is nothing interesting going on there. Um, again, on the network side, uh, we currently use callback hell, and we're super happy with it, so I'm hoping to replace that with uh, the data flow that I showed. And what I want to uh, concentrate on for now is uh, the in-process REST, and that was something uh, I came up, discovered. I didn't come up with it. I discovered it just kind of jumped in my face uh, when uh, working for the BBC. And that was the idea that um, this sort of the, the rest idea um, of having uh, simple verbs with, a, with sort of a data store that actually you don't have to have a web server to make that really work well for you. Um, you can actually use it within your process. And that means um, you use your eyes to reference your objects. Um, we call them store references. Um, that these URIs, unlike pointers, they can be persisted independently. 
Um, they're structured. Um, we can do computations on them. Um, and they can refer to, for example, to a single object or a group. And the reason why that becomes interesting is um, that um, I will get to right now. So we started off um, using these URIs when communicating to, or in the, soft, in, the, in the part that communicates to the backend servers. Um, and of course, when you have an offline app, you need to sort of, uh, an app that can be offline or online or something, we, we, we needed some way to persist, not just the data, but also what objects haven't we synced yet, right? Uh, and of course, we can't persist the pointers because those will change if the app is killed in the meantime. We also don't really want to persist the objects themselves in the upload queue because that's kind of silly if, if, if the user makes 10 changes and we have to unique them and then it's, it gets really messy. So instead, we, we, we have these URIs and we persist the URIs, right? And that means we can just unique them because any changes that are made to the model um, will just accumulate. And um, once, once we, and, and, and we just take the, the most recent version of the object, fetch that from, the, from, from, from our in-memory store when we actually go to send it. Um, and, and we used that, and, and actually at that point we didn't really have the URIs yet. That, that we discovered that at that point, that that might be a good idea. And then once we had that, we, we, we looked at our persistence, and we noticed that we could do the same thing there, because essentially when we write out to disk, it's kind of the same thing, right? Um, and we, want to make, we wanted to make it asynchronous, because of course the disk is slower than, than our in-memory updates, and we have the same issue. It's like we make, oh, also we, we bucket. So, well, one thing is we, we actually just store JSON files on disk, and we bucket them a little bit, so we don't store every single task as a single JSON file. That would be crazy. We're, we're only half crazy. Um, and uh, there, uh, we, we, it turned out it really useful to be able to compute on these URIs because to get the bucket, we just chop the last part off the URI that tells us what the object is, right? And then, then we do the same uniquing that we did before, and whoop de doo you know, that's, that's our persistence key. And then, of course, we have, then we notice that actually, that actually really works well for our UI as well. We, we have this um, uh, problem mostly when, when, when logging in that, you know, we get, suddenly get huge amounts of data from the, um, from the back end. And we want to keep, both keep the UI in sync at all times, but also keep it fluid. Um, and that's a bit of an issue. And also, of course, react quickly, right? Because all these changes that are coming in from the back end, it could, could be a thousand tasks, right? We don't want to notify the UI every time. That'd be crazy. Um, but also, on the other hand, we don't want to, you know, arbitrarily introduce uh, delays, right? Because if somebody, our sync is so fast that if you, if you, if you hit something in, on one device, it shows up immediately on the other device. And it's silly to, you know, put in a five second delay just because. Um, and of course, the, um, and actually I just saw a blog post recently, somebody recommending um, perform selector with delay. Yeah, don't do that, that doesn't work, right? Because if changes keep coming, with cancel, right? And, and because if you do that, and changes keep coming in cr more quickly, then your uh, delay, it, the update will never get called. So that doesn't work. It's, it's, it, it seems like it should, but it doesn't. And it turns out that your, our URI queues were, were perfect for this, right? Because essentially what happened is um, if there's not a lot of load, we just um, uh, send the notification with the specific object URI that um, we want to now update. But if the load gets, gets bigger, um, we, we start throttling them and chopping more things off the back, right? Because we suddenly don't know anymore whether it's, this is just this one object, it's, it's a lot of objects. It could be just this bucket, right? Just this list. Or if there's a lot of stuff coming in, at some point we might just go, ah, screw it. We, um, we, something changed, just update everything. Right? And it's, it's all the same mechanism. And it, essentially all the, um, oh, wait a second, I should have put the slide up, I'm sorry. Um, th this is what I just talked about, oh, sorry. 
I got into it. Um, so again, we, we have the bucketizing of the storage, um, we have the uniqueing for the network, it's persistable, it's asynchronous, and of course you get the dynamic coalescing when you have the, uh, uh, for the UI. Right? And, it's, and again, we just discovered this over time. But knowing that there's something like in process rest, these architectural elements, we okay, yeah, okay, I can use this, I can use that. And that's sort of my, my, my final real slide, is that architects need to be humble. They really do. Um, I once had um, uh, somebody come in for a job interview, at, at, that was at Livescribe, and he called himself a software architect. And my first question, of course, being mean as I am, is like, what's software architecture? And he couldn't say. Um, that's a bit of a problem. So he mumbled and mumbled a bit, a little bit, and then he said something about best practices. And uh, no, that's wrong, right? That's, that's completely wrong, right? Because it's not about, oh, you have a list of things, and if you do that, then you're going to be good. No, it's, um, it's a toolbox, right? You, you see your problems. Uh, you, you know, I can, oh, I can use this, I could, I could potentially use that. I can, you, need to, you need to adapt your, your architecture to your problem. Um, and of course, a lot of times that doesn't happen. And if you see somebody, you know, saying, oh, this is the perfect architecture, yeah, yeah, just ignore them. So, that was really it. Um, coming, just a quick summary, I think software architecture is the key to success with software. Um, we saw some examples at the beginning. Um, what it is, it's connecting all the pieces, and in many ways, that's, I think that is a lot of essentially what our skill, what our art is, right, is what are the pieces, how do we connect them. Um, I personally think we need some linguistic support. It would really help. And um, even, but even without that, architecture is a great toolbox if you're a humble architect. Any questions? Okay. I was going to say, yeah. Uh, what's the difference between URI and event streaming? So CQRS plus event streaming, the event streaming and the URI is almost, feels the same. Um, event streaming, uh, so they're certainly, I mean, they're, they're kind of, it's a, it's a bit of a category error because they're two different, I mean, two different categories of stuff, but uh, they certainly uh, interact well. So if you're doing, uh, for example, the BBC system was an event streamer. And uh, together with then a, a, a um, sort of a central database, wasn't a database, it was a hierarchy of stuff. And the URIs were uh, uh, very central um, to making the event streaming work. So I think, yeah. That, that's it's a representation that nicely fits f of an event. So a URI is an event. Well, no, URI is, no, your, I mean, well, you can actually, I mean, in the end, you can encode just about, you know, you can make an, a URI point to anything, so you can have an event colon URI, uh, but typically, I would say event uh, URI points to a, a resource, right, to something that is changed by an event. But again, but of course, you can have persisted events and then have events and number them or something, or time or whatever, I mean, certainly, yeah. Um, that's okay, why, that's I why you're, I mean, there, there is a reason they're called URIs, right? Because they're universal, <laughs> right? And if, if you can somehow shoehorn the thing into uh, uh, being a resource, then you can re reference it with a URI. Okay, thanks. I see the difference. <laughs> okay. Cool. I'm sure there are about a million questions, but this is why the dinner is for. We don't have much more time for questions because we're running super late. But I wanted to thank you very much for just dam damaging my brain for the last uh, <laughs> 45 minutes. Yeah, everybody's ready for the movie now, right? Yeah, yeah. We're, first, we have the panel. Uh, oh, that's and, right, the panel. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, you yeah. can further damage our brains. Uh, <laughs> All right, uh, we make a quick break, like 10 minutes or so, and then we'll be back for the panel. Thank you very much. Big round of applause for myself. Thank you.